welcome to the 10th video in this series on the history of astronomy. And after some 2,000 years of various cultures trying to figure out just how do the planets move, this problem will finally be solved by Johannes Kepler and his discovery of his three laws of planetary motion. Let's start with a quick summary on who Johannes Kepler was. He was born in the 16th century in the Holy Roman Empire, near what is today Stuttgart, Germany. In fact, the house he was born in is still standing. After his university studies, he bounces around a bit, getting a few different jobs as an astronomer or a mathematician, until he eventually lands a job with Tycho Brahe. If you watched the previous video, you'll know that Tycho Brahe was a Danish astronomer who's known for having built the first and only mural sextant observatory in Europe. But Kepler never worked there. He worked with him after this observatory had been decommissioned, and astronomy had now moved on to observing stars with telescopes thanks to Galileo. Now apparently, Kepler and Brahe didn't have a very good relationship, but they shared the same passion for astronomy. And when Brahe died, while on his deathbed, he asked Kepler to make sure that all the hard work and data not have been for nothing. Well, true to his word, Kepler took this data and published a very famous book called the Astronomia Nova, where he introduced his new model for the solar system. And based on this data, he discovered three laws of planetary motion, although only the first two were published in the Astronomia Nova. Let's now go through these laws one at a time. The first law states that planetary orbits are ellipses with the sun at a focus. So what does this mean? We first have to clarify what exactly is an ellipse. An ellipse is a curve that kind of looks like an oval, but it has some specific properties. It has two axes, a major axis and a minor axis, whose lengths are given as 2a and 2b. Along the major axis lies two focus points, or foci or foci, equidistant from the center. The location of these focus points is such that were you to draw a line from one focus point to the curve of the ellipse and then to the other focus point, that distance will be the same no matter what point you pick along the ellipse. You can easily make an ellipse by placing two pins on a piece of paper, connecting them with a string, and then with a pencil you pull that string tight and trace out the curve. And that will give you an ellipse. The difference in length between the major axis and minor axis is measured using something called the eccentricity. The eccentricity is also related to the distance of the focus points from the center. If the eccentricity is zero, then the major and minor axes have the same length, and the focus points are both at the center. This gives you a circle. The larger the eccentricity, the more stretched out the ellipse is. So, what does Kepler's law say? It says you place the sun at one of these focus points, and then the planets will go around the sun along the curve of the ellipse. Now, if you've been watching this series, you'll know that elliptical orbits had already been suggested going as far back as the Indian Golden Age, as well as having been tried by numerous Muslim astronomers. So why didn't they work? Well, it's not enough to say the orbit is an ellipse. It's an ellipse around what? And actually, Kepler initially tried putting the sun at the center, and it actually worked quite well. The biggest error out of all the planets was only three arc minutes. That's three sixtieths of a degree. Now, most astronomers at the time would have said, that's good enough for government work, but Kepler was so convinced by the precision and accuracy of Tycho Brahe's measurements that he decided this error was too big. So he scratched it and modified it. And when he moved the sun from the center to a focus point, he got a better match. If you're enjoying this video so far, please take a quick second to like and subscribe, leave a comment, maybe share it with a few friends, and if you'd like to support the channel, I'll have a link to my Kofi page at the end of the video. You can also find it in the video description. Like I said, Indian and Muslim astronomers had also tried ellipses, and maybe they even tried putting the sun out of focus. But it's not enough to say the planets go around an ellipse. You need to also specify how do they go around this ellipse. And that brings us to Kepler's second law. This law states that a line connecting a planet and the sun sweeps out equal areas and equal times. What exactly does this mean? Well, we have our elliptical orbit, and we've got the sun out of focus, and let's say the planet starts at some point along the orbit. We now draw a line from the sun to the planet, and after some time passes, the planet's going to be somewhere else along the orbit. 
If you then fill in the area swept out by this line, that area will be the same anywhere along the orbit as long as the same amount of time has passed. So if I take a different point along the orbit, and again draw a line connecting the sun and the planet, and allow the same amount of time to pass, the area swept out by this line will be the same. Now, I think I made a mistake in this drawing. I drew this in a symmetric fashion, giving maybe the idea that symmetry is required for this law. It's not. You can take any two points along the orbit, and as long as the same amount of time has gone by, you will always sweep out the same area. It's actually interesting because Kepler came to this law based off of a series of false assumptions. One assumption was that the sun pushes the planet along the orbit. Now, this kind of sounds like gravity, but actually he's assuming that the planet is being pushed along the orbit. He is adhering to Aristotle's views of physics, which states that in order to keep an object in motion, it must be continually pushed along by a force, otherwise it would come to rest. In the Christian world, the explanation for planetary motion was that angels were pushing the planet along. This is also somewhat surprising because Kepler lived at the same time as Galileo, and in fact was well aware of him, and I think he even met him. And Galileo had proved experimentally that the concept of inertia was correct. Objects will keep moving in a straight line forever at a fixed speed unless acted on by some force. But I guess Kepler was not aware of this, or maybe he wasn't convinced by it. As a result of this mistaken assumption, he reasons that this force must be proportional to the planet's speed and 1 over the distance to the sun. Now be careful here, he's not using the word force in the same way we use it today in physics, because he's adhering to Aristotle's view of physics, not Newton's. Newton hasn't come around yet. So because he thinks a force is required to keep the object in motion, the force must be linked to the velocity, not the acceleration. Now, once Newton comes along, we'll know that the force of gravity is not related to the speed of the planet and is actually proportional to 1 over the distance squared. And it also doesn't point along its orbit, but towards the sun. Both of these laws were published in Kepler's Astronomia Nova, and they worked really well. But Kepler continued working on this problem of planetary motion, and 10 years later, he publishes a third law. That states that a planet's orbital period squared is proportional to its semi-major axis cubed. Again, I'm going to clarify what this means. Let's start off by drawing our ellipse with its major and minor axes, and we now place the sun on a focus point. For simplicity, it doesn't actually really matter. Let's say our starting point is at the closest point to the sun. This is called the perihelion. The semi-major axis is half of the major axis, which we're calling A. The period of the orbit is the total time it takes for the planet to make one full revolution. And Kepler's third law states that this period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. If you use what I'm going to call Earth-centered units, that is, we take the period to be measured in years, which is the Earth's period, and the semi-major axis in astronomical units, which is the semi-major axis of the Earth, then the proportionality constant is 1 because if we plug in one year, we need to get one astronomical unit. This law now gives us a recipe for figuring out how far away each planet is from the sun. All we have to do is measure their periods. Now I should point out that today this is how Kepler's third law is stated, because this one is actually correct. Kepler himself, though, didn't state it quite like this. Instead of the semi-major axis, he stated it as the mean distance and these two are not equal. And actually, I'm not even sure what he means by mean distance. Does he mean the average geometric distance for an ellipse, or does he mean the time average distance? Those numbers are not the same, and they're both different from the semi-major axis. For both, that difference is related to the eccentricity of the orbit. But if the eccentricity is small, the difference between either mean and the semi-major axis is also small. It's of order the eccentricity squared. And all of the planets have relatively small eccentricities. In fact, they're so small that if you were to accurately draw the planetary orbits, you probably would not be able to tell that they weren't perfect circles. The orbits I've drawn here are highly exaggerated, and no planet has an eccentricity anywhere near this big. So there you have it. These are Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, and apart from the minor quibble between the semi-major axis and the mean distance, 
they still stand today. These three laws revolutionize astronomy. For centuries, astronomers knew that Ptolemy's model didn't work, but nobody could find a better one. And now, finally, a solution has been found. Kepler proves the geocentric model is wrong. The planets go around the sun. Or do they? In the next video, Newton's going to introduce his three laws of motion and his universal law of gravitation, and he's going to have something to say about Kepler's laws of planetary motion and just how exactly does the solar system work. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see the next chapter in the history of astronomy, be sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell to be notified for the release of future physics videos, and if you like my channel, please consider leaving a small donation to help out the channel. You can do so at my Ko-fi page, or you can leave a super thanks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.